we think about discipleship, we often think of it in terms of pop culture rather than true biblical discipleship. I mean, we, <laughs> we developed this model based more on the relationship between Obi-Wan and Anakin Skywalker than the relationship that Jesus actually had with his disciples. Because of this trend in the church, we have developed this environment where Christians who imagine themselves to be mature in the faith are no longer learning and where new believers do not feel empowered to do the work of genuine real ministry. We have created an environment for ourselves in which older generations almost always see younger generations as inferior and unable to do things rightly. The negative result is that popular Christianity becomes this really shallow organism that, like with Anakin, feels so oppressive that people leave churches that are so wrapped up in the Christian subculture we have developed in favor of a lone wolf type of Christian faith, which is just as unbiblical. We surely create a multitude of problems for ourselves when we approach discipleship with this sort of top-down hierarchical mentality, where the teachers or mentors are concerned more with their authority than with living as Jesus lives. We produce condemning preachers in small group atmospheres where people are not free to ask questions or share their thoughts about a certain theological topic. Even in the home, children, they are afraid to be open and honest with parents who are their primary disciples. We become more devoted to our own religious dogmas than than to a genuine exploration of God's word, which was breathed out by God and not following the mere convictions of its human authors. Is it possible for us to actually become genuine disciple makers in the likeness of Christ? Join me in Luke chapter 6 verses 43 through 49. This is the word of God. A good tree doesn't produce bad fruit. On the other hand, a bad tree doesn't produce good fruit. For each tree is known by its fruit. Figs aren't gathered from thorn bushes, nor grapes picked from the bramble bush. A good man produces good out of the good storeroom of his heart. An evil man produces evil out of the evil storeroom. For his mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? I will show you what someone is like who comes to me, hears my words, and acts on them. He is like a man building a house, who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood came, the river crashed against that house and couldn't shake it, because it was well built. But the one who hears and does not act is like a man who built a house on the ground without a foundation. The river crashed against it, and immediately it collapsed, and the destruction of that house was great. I want to look at this passage of Scripture with you in three parts. I want to consider uh, the root, uh, the person, who we are, our character. I want to consider the fruit that we produce that comes from this tree of a person, um, if we are comparing ourselves to trees, that is. And then finally, I want to consider uh, the term servanthood and discipleship. First, we'll look at the root. Before we arrive at this passage in Scripture, Jesus is actually teaching about those, uh, about how those who lack will receive and about how those who are self-righteous or self-satisfied, they have received their reward on this earth. He gives instructions for people to get this, love their enemies and pray for those who persecute them. And uh, he gives instruction for people not to be judgmental, not to be condemning regarding the moral inadequacies of others, but instead to always forgive. With all of this instruction, uh, we have to realize that Christ, he is ushering in a kingdom of humility and of people who put others first. That is the buildup before we get to the passage that we are in. He is ushering in a kingdom of humility and of people who put others first. If I am to follow Christ, then I I realize that I must decrease and I must consider others to be more important than myself. 
After teaching these things, Luke records Jesus also teaching that this sort of good fruit can only come from a good tree. It is not the sort of action that we can simply will for ourselves. If we are not humble trees, we simply will not produce humble fruit. This means that the conversation regarding the manner in which we actually make disciples, it must begin with the heart condition of the disciple maker. What is my heart condition? In verse 44, we read Jesus teaching that a tree is actually known by its fruit. And sadly, it also reveals that if we hold to a sort of top-down hierarchical model of discipleship, this prideful fruit reveals that we are not humble trees cultivated by Christ. Instead, we are prideful trees who hope to cultivate themselves into righteousness, and it just it does not work that way. Here, we might ask how this humble character or heart condition is produced within the genuine disciple maker, actually making him able to bear genuine good fruit in any discipling relationship. This question, it is precisely why we had to begin with repentance last week. And if you did not get to listen to or read that, I want to encourage you to go and do so. Hit the pause button. Go go and listen to last week's post. What we noticed as we looked at Luke chapter 3 together was that when John the Baptist, and Jesus for that matter, taught, uh, when they did discipleship, the goal was the repentance of those being discipled. John particularly taught that people should bear fruit that is consistent with repentance. We saw that in Luke chapter 3 verse 8. And as we examine the ministry of Elijah in whose likeness John preached, we also discovered that God, God is actually the one who gives repentance to each person by grace. We saw that in 1 Kings chapter 18 verse 37, and it was supported by Acts chapter 5 verse 31 and 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 25. To become a good tree then, one must be cultivated into a good tree, being given a repentant heart by Christ. It has always been this way. Sola gratia, even presenting itself in the Old Testament and in 1 Kings with the story of Elijah. Even Adam and Eve, they were preserved from death by grace alone, having earned for themselves condemnation and eternal death. This is the only way that anyone can bear good fruit, fruit that is consistent with repentance, especially when it comes to discipleship in the church. So we have people who will try, try and do discipleship, serving as teachers in the church and in in schools, serving as pastors or elders, serving as evangelists, serving as deacons, serving as parents or grandparents or wellness trainers or trade mentors or anything that we want to do in this life who haven't been given a repentant heart by Christ. So instead of producing good fruit in discipleship, we see much bad fruit produced in the world. What does it look like, though, for someone to have been given a repentant heart even though he or she is teaching and training others. First, this person is always learning. I often meet people in every age group. It's not just the older generations, but in every age group who have stopped learning. We reach a certain point and for some reason we believe that we have it figured out. We know how things ought to be done. We have our theology figured out. We know what we believe, and we know enough to tell others the exact right way to do things. We hold so rigidly to what we think we know that we no longer learn from Christ. Listen, when we read passages of Scripture like Philippians chapter 3, we recognize that not even the Apostle Paul, in the depth of his knowledge, considered himself to have already attained even knowledge of God. You can read that in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 through 12. If God is infinite in his being, having always existed, then no matter how deep our knowledge, there is always more to learn. A repentant heart recognizes that it cannot attain all knowledge. All knowledge. 
If the substance of my knowledge is incomplete, I will always be learning and always be trying to understand deeper theology, different ways of doing things, cultural changes, and so on. And in a fallen context, I must also recognize that, man, I may be wrong in what I think myself to know. A repentant heart, it causes me to realize that that my way, my way is not the only way, but that every way of doing things must be measured according to God's word, God's instruction, and God's way of doing things. This repentant heart, I think, will even carry over into eternity where we will be honest about what knowledge we have learned is factual and what is theoretical or philosophical. Two, a person who has been given a repentant heart by Christ, a teacher who has been given a repentant heart is always growing. If we are always learning and the purpose of discipleship is repentance, then we are also always growing particularly in our humility and in the exaltation of Christ alone. If we find that repentance and exaltation of Christ is not increasing in our lives, we are not good trees being cultivated by Christ, and our discipleship will actually bear bad fruit. So we get into this mentality too where we think all discipleship is good discipleship. No, not all discipleship is good discipleship. Discipleship is good only when it comes from a repentant heart and only when the person discipling, the discipler, the mentor is him or herself growing in humility and growing in the exaltation of Christ, always having a repentant heart. And three, the discipler who has been given a repentant heart by Christ is always reforming, semper reformanda. If we are always growing in our humility and in the exaltation of Christ alone, then we are always changing. In fact, everyone is always changing, some for good and some for bad. None of us are ever just staying the same. Our theology, it is ever being reformed. We don't get stuck in our ways. There is an ebb and flow in our lives because the relationship that we get to have with Christ, it is dynamic. This is for God's glory and for our good. If I am always reforming, it means I have not fallen into the trap of thinking too highly of myself. God is the only one who is unchanging the uncaused cause. And since our existence is contingent upon his, then we are ever changing in response to him and he is the foundation. And if I ever refuse change in response to God, not people, I insinuate that I am in the position of God. As soon as we try and hold on to our comfort, our way of doing things, Or as soon as we try and hold on to what is familiar, we become the greatest hindrance to ourselves, especially regarding our role in discipleship. And so we know this, God God cultivates my heart for repentance and humility. Secondly, we'll look at the fruit that is produced by a genuine disciple maker, by someone who is a good tree, a repentant heart that is actually pouring into and teaching others. A repentant heart, it causes the teacher, the mentor, the pastor, the deacon, the parent, the employer, the boss, the trainer, etc. and so on to become humble. Even treating students, children, and congregation members as though they were more important than him or herself. After all, is this not the example that Christ set for us with his own disciples? Just for a second, I want to look forward in the gospel of Luke to chapter 22 verses 24 through 30 as Jesus taught his own disciples. Then, this is God's word starting in Luke chapter 22 verse 24, then a dispute also arose among them about who should be considered the greatest. (laughs) How often do we have that conversation, right? But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles dominate them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, 
to do something differently. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you must become like the youngest. And whoever leads like the one serving, like the slave. For who is greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I am among you as the one who serves. As Jesus, I am among you as the one who serves. You are the ones who stood by me in my trials. I bestow on you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And the insinuation there is as I serve you and you will sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. First, I want to notice that the giving of the kingdom, it did not depend on the faithfulness of the disciples. Christ gave because he chose to give for God's glory and for the good of his people. Second, notice the disciples' focus. Who would be greater? I hear this type of conversation more than I would like in the modern day church. Pastors, they assume that they are greater because of their position. Members, because of how long they have been at a certain church. Deacons, because they have been selected or elected by the congregation to be deacons. And so on and so on. This is, we see this argument in the church today and it's so dangerous. It's like the disciples. But Christ, Christ, he taught and exemplified very plainly and very explicitly that the greatest, the greatest must become like the youngest. And those who lead must serve. Thus, service, humility, and the considering of others to be more important than ourselves, even to the point of becoming like the youngest person in a relationship, is the fruit, is the outcome of a repentant heart that is actually cultivated by Christ. Luke chapter 6 verse 45 tells us that a good person produces good fruit out of the good stored up in his heart. The good stored up in his heart is it's given by Christ and the overflow of Christ's goodness comes out in our humility and in our servanthood, especially as we disciple others, especially as I speak to you now. This is why, this is why I can't listen in good conscience to preachers like Joel Osteen or Craig Rochelle or Stephen Furtick or T.D. Jakes or any other prosperity or borderline prosperity preacher. They're always teaching people how people might become great. But God, throughout all of Scripture, teaches that we must, by the repentant hearts produced by Him, become humble servants. For discipleship, and this means simply that the teacher cannot be concerned with his own greatness or recognition. That speaks deeply into my life. He considers the one being taught to be more important than himself. Fathers consider their sons to be more important. Employers and managers consider their employees to be more important. Pastors consider others to be more important. And as we reflect upon this idea, we begin to recognize a, an absolute beauty in genuine Christian community, especially through discipleship that is not present with any other group, secular or sacred, in the world. The sad reality is most organizations that dare refer to themselves as churches have not been cultivated by Christ into such a community of humility and of repentance. In verses 46 through 49, Jesus states that there are some who call him Lord, who are bad trees producing bad fruit. The one who comes to Christ hears his words and acts on them. He is like 
a man who builds a house on a firm foundation, the one who merely calls Jesus Lord but does not abide in his word, is like a man who builds his house on the sand. The destruction of his house is great. So we can choose to build a house or do discipleship for the purpose of, of, uh, of our application here by our own means, being stuck in our ways, never humbly growing in our own knowledge, never admitting that we can be wrong, and not having a repentant heart that can only be given by Christ. The result of that sort of discipleship is destruction. But if we are humble and repentant, especially in discipling relationships, whether we are mentoring others in the church or whether we are raising our own children, the house we build as we abide in Christ cannot be shaken according to this parable. The house in Jesus' parable that he is telling, it represents the life of the person even while we live on this earth. Of myself, I suffer every infirmity. And in Christ, my life is secure and I am not shaken by the storm. The storm still comes, but Christ keeps me secure because he has cultivated my heart and uses the storm to cultivate my heart still. A repentant heart produces good fruit. Finally, we get to consider the the term servanthood discipleship. We arrive at this idea that is almost entirely absent in the Christian subculture that people have created for themselves in our day. The one teaching is a servant to the one he or she teaches. This does not mean that he is there at every beckoning call of the person. Look, he's not omnipresent. He's not omnipotent. He is not God. It does mean that he is at every opportunity doing what he thinks is best for someone else, for the one he is teaching, pastors for the ones in their congregations, deacons for the people that they serve, teachers for the people they're, they're teaching, parents for their children. He is to consider himself to be less important. He's even to consider himself to be like the younger person in a relationship. And those who have more experience in life, they do not hoard their experiential authority, but rather humble themselves as servants to those on whom they are pouring their wisdom. This is the fruit of coming from a disciple maker who is actually genuinely following Christ. And if anyone approaches discipleship any other way, he is not teaching as Christ taught or as Christ leads us to teach. Indeed, this is the attitude we all ought to strive for. And woe to those who peddle influence like so many politicians or who care only about their teaching authority and their own methodology. In his letter to the Philippian believers, Paul wrote this, and you can see this in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Make your own attitude that of Christ Jesus who, existing in the form of God, get this, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. For this reason, God highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name so that in the name of Jesus, every knee will bow under the earth and on the earth and in heaven and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. 
Look, the genuine Christian develops an attitude like that of Christ, who emptied himself by assuming the form of a, of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. Jesus himself, he condescended so that people might repent and receive life. He, being one with God, made himself the Son of Man. He humbled himself even to the point of death on a cross. And as Jesus was in our lowly estate, he taught in such a way that his disciples were encouraged and not condemned. He did not complain to them about all of their imperfections or about all of the things that they were not doing correctly. Instead, he spoke words of life, teaching about God and calling them, his disciples, to a life of genuine repentance. Christ even taught this way to large crowds of people where most would choose not to follow him. And we see this in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. As a large crowd was gathering, the people were flocking to him from every town. He said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed. As he was sowing, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds of the sky ate it up. Other seed fell on the rock. And when it sprang up, it withered since it lacked moisture. Other seed fell among thorns. The thorns sprang up with it and choked it. Still other seed fell on good ground. When it sprang up, it produced a crop 100 times what was sown. As he said this, he called out, Anyone who has ears to hear should listen. Whom are we to disciple? Who are we to serve? The answer is everyone unconditionally. Many will reject the promise that Christ has given, but we still serve. How are we to disciple and how are we to serve? By abiding in and proclaiming God's word, which is the seed in this parable. We see that in Luke chapter 8 verse 11. Jesus did not say, go and share your testimony alone. Our testimony, look, that may be a good tool, but with only our testimony, we are actually guilty of using the gospel to elevate self. God's word is the seed, and we spread it everywhere as we serve everyone. Jesus, he did not say, go and share a moral story. He did not say, go and speak motivationally. He did not say, go and tell people that they can rise above the negativity in their life. He did not say, go and teach people that I am a crutch and that I want them to be rich or famous. No, Jesus said, go and make disciples, Matthew 28, and do so as a servant to all considering yourselves to be less important, even younger than those who are learning from you. What a, what a beautiful picture that we don't see in any other place, secular or sacred, only in Christ. Sadly, much of Christian subculture is full of people who teach but do not serve. This means, just as Jesus stated in his parable, that there are many people who have been exposed to his word, who have not genuinely surrendered to Christ and received a repentant heart from him. If you are one of those people who are dissatisfied with the church, I want to encourage you on this point. Ask God to give you a heart of repentance that you might serve. Are you one of those who feels like others just aren't doing enough? Ask God to give you a repentant heart that you might serve. Are you not visited enough? Is the music not your style or the message is too convicting? Are there not enough programs for you? Let us all ask God to give us repentant hearts that we might serve and disciple according to his ways. When God produces this attitude within us, then we get to stand on the firm foundation and benefit greatly on a deeper level than we could ever imagine. A heart 
of repentance means serving those that I teach. God cultivates my heart for repentance and humility. A repentant heart produces good fruit. And a heart of repentance means serving those I teach. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do for us. And thank you for the repentant heart that you produce within us. Let us be willing. Let us be open and not fall into the trap that this world presents us with. False discipleship. Let us be genuine disciple makers with the genuine attitude of discipleship. Amen. Mm -hmm.